you've tuned into Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, a video podcast series. Our episode starts right now. Here's your host, Dominique Vale. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Invisi Youth Chat Sessions, where you can check in for your dose of stigma breaking, humor filling, motivation loving, life hacks, and motivation for all the medically adultish people in life. I'm Dominique Vale, founder of InvisiEuth and host of the InvisiEuth Chat Sessions, and today is Season 3B, Episode 37, and it's an episode that I'm very excited about. So I know many of you guys who followed my journey or know InvisiEuth and my development of InvisiEuth, you know that my background in sports played a really integral part in the way that I work and just my day-to-day. So it would be no surprise that I would want to have an entire episode dedicated to not only the power of sports, but also getting to talk about adaptive sports, talking about para-athletes, and especially with the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics happening, we have not one, but two special guests. You guys are getting back-to-back double guests with me, so it's very lucky. We get two Paralympians who are with Team Great Britain in their track and field team. We have Polly Mayton, and Livy Breen joining us for the episode. And I'm excited to introduce both of them to you. Now, Polly is a British para sprinter and long jumper. Um, She was born with a partial right limb and runs with a prosthetic arm and competes in the T47 category. Now, there are lots of categories that define based on disability for the Paralympics. So I won't explain to you the nitty gritty of what T47 means, but that's where Polly gets to do her sprinting and long jumping. Um, So when Polly's school at a young age had free trials with the Lions Club as a kid, she really discovered her love of running and that blossomed into her training and getting into sports. And then that actually led to her being scouted for para sports at England Athletics, which then developed into her having such an incredible career at a really young age. She's won a silver medal in the world championships, two bronze medals in the European championships, and was on Team GB with the Rio 2016 Olympics, and will be joining again in 2020 as well. And when she's not on the track, Polly is also a student at the University of Oxford, studying history and politics, one of the schools I wanted to go to when I was in university. And many of you guys will recognize her through and busy as well, because Polly is part of our leadership program. She's one of our global brand leader ambassadors as well. And Livy is a Welsh Paralympian that competes in the T38 sprint and F38 long jumps events and has, I mean, I'm going to be reading just a few of the accolades of Livy. It's like you go on her Wikipedia, it's just like there's metal pictures everywhere. It's insane. Um, Born with her twin brother, Livy was contracted a meningitis type of illness at birth and was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at the age of two, along with being hearing impaired. Levy really found a solace in sports and her career in track and field blossomed almost immediately. Um, She was the second youngest Paralympian chosen to represent Team Great Britain at the 2012 London Paralympics. And from that point forward, her career just has continued to grow so quickly. She's won a gold in long jump at the Gold Coast Games in 2018, a bronze in the Dubai 2019 IPC World Championships in long jump, and Livy is going to be a three-time Paralympian from being at the London 2012, Rio 2016, and now Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. And also, you'll find out in one of our segments later that Livy is a great follow on Instagram, as is Polly, um, and you'll get lots of content from the two of them going on Instagram. So hello, Livy and Polly. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so excited for you guys watching on our YouTube channel. If you're listening, definitely pop up onto our YouTube channel as well because I did make a slight early request to have Libby and Polly wear some of their kit for Team GB. And as they talk, you'll get to see some of their great gear at the same time as well with them. So it'll be, it's a very, you get a fashion show and get to learn about pair sports all at once with the three of us. It'll be very great. <laughs> And we're going to jump right in and have a fun, rapid game getting to know these two athletes in Five Second Challenge. Five Second Challenge. Five 
five second challenge. Five second challenge is our fun intro segment where I'm going to be throwing rapid fire questions at Libby and Polly, bouncing them between the two, and they get five seconds each to give their first answer. So the terror on now Libby's face going, oh, it's timed. Um, <laughs> um, and, well, Polly's the first one, so you get five seconds to, to pause and relax, Libby. Um, all right, Polly, are you ready? You're leading us off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Polly, favorite cool down exercise? Uh, hamstring stretch. Got it's it. really big. <laughs> Lily, favorite piece of your gym or athletic equipment that you use? Pardon, sorry. Um, your favorite piece of gym or athletic equipment that you use? Um, spikes. <laughs> oh, I like it. You guys do have really nice shoes. I just I have to point that out. Um, Polly, what is your favorite thing about the new Paralympic gear that you guys have gotten for the team? Okay, I'm gonna be controversial and say the bucket hat, but I didn't actually receive a bucket hat. But I've seen the bucket hats and they're really cool, but I didn't get one, but I'm gonna say bucket hat. <laughs> oh, it, they, they were really nice hats, I do have to Yeah. Well. <laughs> Libby, what is one of your favorite things about being a Paralympian? Uh, exploring and meeting incredible people and I don't know, making friends like Polly for life. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Polly, what is your favorite sport to watch as a spectator? Uh, gymnastics. I think it's really cool. I've loved seeing the gymnastics this time around. Oh, well, very nice, very nice. Libby, what's your favorite medal you've won to date? What's my favorite what, sorry? Your medal, your favorite medal you've won. Oh, Commonwealth Games in 2018 in the Gold Coast. You were like, yeah, that was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Probably would have been mine too. Um, so Polly, if you could pick what country to host the next Paralympic Games that you would want to go to compete in, what country would you pick? I have to say London. Like, I'm very sad that I was too young to compete in London. And I went to go watch, and I'm very jealous of Livy that she got to compete. I, but <laughs> yeah, even watching it, you could, it's, yeah, I don't think you can beat London. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Livy, if you had to describe somebody that was watching the Paralympics for the first time, what would be a way you would describe it for someone? Inspirational. Love that. Very good. I love it. And then the, <laughs> the same question for both of you. So I'm going to go with Polly first. If you could compete in any other event at a summer or winter Paralympics, which would you pick? Okay, I couldn't do it but I'd love to be able to be good at diving. Like, I think it would be so cool, um, but I don't think I'd have any ability at doing it. <laughs> like, how flat board? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> I would just be too scared of the height. Um, <laughs> what about you? I think I'd love to do gymnastics, but obviously me having a coordination impairment would be quite interesting. <laughs> And then I'm gonna do the same question again for both of you to end it. So Polly first, what is one thing that if you had full range of Tokyo and you guys were allowed to travel through the city, what was one thing you were looking forward to that you were wanting to do while you were there? Um, I've got two cats at home and like, I know in Tokyo they have like cat cafes and I think that would be really cool, but. <laughs> Um, maybe maybe there, maybe you'll just see somebody else have a cat and be like just vicarious with the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Libby, what about you? I basically have a place I want to go to, but I can't remember what it's called. It's called like a Rabuchi. Rabuchi? Rabuchi? I can't think what it's called. It's quite famous in Tokyo. But oh. my mind's gone blank. But it's called. But I would really like to go there and obviously walk around Tokyo as well and get the experience. But obviously, sadly, we can't do that. But that, that Olympic, the Olympic the sort of the village that you guys are in, it was very entertaining watching all of the different buildings for each team and how they all would watch other games. So they, so may, maybe where you guys get to quarantine as well will be a very, will be a very fun, unique experience to be in lockdown with just a bunch of athletes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. 
we're gonna go right after that segment and we're gonna go into, I'm gonna put my journalist hat on with these ladies and we're going to go into one of our old but favorite segments. It is Medical Pop Headlines. Medical Pop Headlines, Medical Pop Headlines, Medical Pop Headlines, Medical Pop. Medical Pop Headlines is one of my favorite segments because we get to talk about news stories and these that we're picking are all centered around Paralympic or Olympic related stories. So we get to have a little bit of funny pop culture chat while also getting to talk about some of these really great news stories that have been happening. And we're going to jump right in. And like I mentioned in the beginning, this is the first time we're doing a pop headline story where one of our guests was part of the headline story. So I'm going to put my, put my journalist voice on. We'll see if I, can, if I still have it from my journalism days in college. We'll see. And I'll read out the beginning headline um, as well. So um, beer and clothing for the Olympic Games with, and Paralympic Games was actually talked about in multiple different teams. The Norwegian beach volley, handball, handball team was fined for not playing in required bikini bottoms at the Tokyo Olympics. The German gymnastics team for girls wore full length Leos um, because they wanted to show a different, um, a different way of their outfits they wear. And also our guest, Libby Breen as well, um, made headlines everywhere, even in the US as well, when an England championship official commented on Libby's um, uniform briefs being um, in air quotes for you guys watching too revealing. Um, so Livy has made quite a lot of headlines and advocating for female athletes to be confident in their uniforms and what they choose to wear um, as well, which has been super fantastic. And I would like to be mindful that as Livy has pointed out on her social media, her briefs were from Adidas, which is a sponsor of Livy's that she's worn for almost a decade now, guys. So let's just keep that stat in mind. So instead of just throwing this first question straight to Libby herself, I'm going to go to her teammate Polly and have her get the first reaction to the story. <laughs> <laughs> Libby's like, oh boy. Um, <laughs> so Polly, I wanted to know, because I know you immediately were someone right on social media that jumped in supporting Libby and also other female athletes in track and field, because you obviously wear pretty much the same and especially in the Paralympic Games your uniforms are essentially identical to each other. So for you, was there something that you thought was beneficial supporting Libby and talking out for female athletes to feel that confidence in their uniform? Yeah, no, definitely. So I was actually there on the day when <laughs> Libby got pulled over. And when it first happened, I was utterly shocked. Like I think Libby's described in a few interviews that she was shocked, but I was so shocked hearing it from afar. I couldn't believe that they'd called her out on it. Um, and I, it upsets me so deeply because I think women's sport is so often about everything else but the sport. Um, and women should be able to wear what they feel com comfortable in and it shouldn't be something, oh, which is, um, yeah, it shouldn't be something which um, is made yeah there shouldn't be points made about it in terms of what I would say would be like the male gaze and sexist comments um and if women want to wear a whole bodysuit they should be able to if women want to wear sprint briefs and a crop top they should also be able to um and I don't think that should be a comment that anyone else but the athlete gets to make I love that yeah and even on Libby on your end was there was there something when you were being had such an immediate reaction from the media and the public that you felt when you were doing your interviews, you were like, I want to, I want to say a certain thing for other maybe younger female athletes that might feel self-conscious in a uniform or want to wear different things or feel comfortable when they're competing. Yeah, obviously I was so shocked at the media coverage it got, but obviously it's really good. And obviously with the handball volleyball team getting told their shorts were too long and then me getting told the complete opposite thing, it definitely goes together, but um, yeah, I think it was just really good to get the media coverage out there and hopefully it doesn't happen again. Hopefully it will change. Obviously, I've had loads of messages from young girls saying, you know, it's happened to me. I really appreciate you speaking now and I'm just like, you're welcome, but I'm so sorry it's happened to you because it's just so wrong, you know, but hopefully it will change and they'll be more open-minded. They won't be like, oh, you should be wearing that, you know, just let us wear what we want. We're athletes, you know. <laughs> 
Exactly. No. And I love how you both kind of point that out too, that it's your, you're able to compete at your best when you're confident, not only in just your physical ability, but what you're wearing to compete in. Yeah. yeah which is really as important for, I mean, not the two of you are still in your mid to early twenties. So I'm like aging you going. So for younger women coming into sport, um, <laughs> I'm like, you're both under 25 and under, so I'm not going to age you on that. But it is important, like you said, for young girls coming in to feel that sense of confidence in whatever they choose to compete in. Yeah, completely. And then our next headline, um, which was actually got sent to me by a couple of our younger athletes in the States, was they found out was for the first time the emblem logo for the Olympic and Paralympic Games for Paris in 2024 will be the same. So usually the logo that goes with the Olympic rings and Paralympic, I call them Agitos, but that could, I could totally be pronouncing those wrong. Um, usually the emblem will shift based on the two games, but the Paris 2024 games made a statement that they wanted their emblem to be the same, to promote inclusivity, to combine the two games into one and to show that um, diversity in sport. So the news stories then started coming out with that step for Paris 2024 asking, well, should the two games then be held simultaneously of one another, or should there be an integration of Paralympic events into an element of the Olympic games as well? So both of you have gone to Paralympic games. I know, as Polly said, when Libby, you competed in London 2012, Polly got to watch as a spectator. Um, and you guys both will watch Olympic games. So for both of you, um, what would, how do you feel about the potential of, should the games then be combined simultaneously? Should there be something that kind of puts the two of them together? What do, I'll start with Libby first. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, don't worry. Obviously I haven't really thought about it, but um, say for example, I've been to two Commonwealth games and um, it's always really fun to compete be in the same place the year with athletes, you know, and hear their experiences. But then it's also ha it's also great to have a Paralympic Games separate and you meet all the different athletes, you know, with different disparities. So I think kind of just leave it how it is, you know, and yeah, I think it's a separate thing, the Olympics and Paralympics, you know, they are separate things, you know. But obviously the Commonwealth Games is a joint thing, but personally I think just leave it how it is. Yeah, and Polly, what about, what on your end? Yeah, I've had like a real, like when I started the sport aged about 11, I didn't understand why they couldn't be together. And I was like, why, why can't they all just be one? And an assessment, I've now realised that that initially came from kind of like an ableist or like model or not thinking the Paralympics was worthy almost of being on its own and needing the validation of the Olympics. Um, and now I've kind of questioned my like thought processes when I first started the sport. I've realised it, it did really come from there. Um, and I think the Paralympics is so special on its as a movement for what it is and for like I think it does genuinely stand for something slightly different to the Olympics I think they're brilliant I think trying to give them the even platforms in terms of terms of media coverage and I think actually having similar logos is great because I think it resonates and it allows, allows people to understand that they're they are parallel events um, but I think keeping them separate but in parallel I think is probably best and as Livy says there are events like the Commonwealth's which I think are great if we kind of continue to do integrated events, but I think it would be a shame to lose like how special the powers are. Yeah, I agree. Like you guys, like you both kind of said to have other events where they're getting, they're infused with each other is a benefit, but keeping that sort of elite level separate because you guys are competing at doing different events as well. They're, they're, I mean, there's volleyball in both sides, but sitting volleyball versus six foot people standing volleyball is a different it's a different way of doing the sport I know the one thing I always thought of was closing ceremony should have something that's Paralympic related in it was always my my always my one thing was they should have some para, more Paralympic athletes or have retired Paralympic athletes in it and just make it a bit more of a statement to remind like Polly mentioned getting that equal media coverage for you guys to have that visibility. If it was in a closing ceremony, it would then kind of trigger a bit more to a mainstream audience. Like, oh, there are games happening like 10 days from now starting that are different, but similar. So kind of per like you said, hopefully Paris wanting to have this 
equality between the two will be beneficial for people to then be able to kind of get to see both of the games um, at different times, but seeing that similarity of the elite athleticism of the athletes that come into it. And then our final news story, um, which lots of people have been talking about, but I wanted to get your opinion on it for both of you guys was mental health awareness for athletes. So it's been brought up in the past with swimmers like Michael Phelps talking about his mental health. He's partnered with the mental health app um, talk space as well. And then this past games, you had the um, tennis player Naomi Osaka pulling out of Wimbledon in the French Open. You had gym, um, gymnast Simone Biles as well, pulling out of the team event and many individual events, talking about their mental well-being and needing that break. Um, and them saying quite a bit in interviews that competing at such a high level that just because they're athletes doesn't mean that mental well-being isn't something they should be supported on. Even mentioning that a lot of teams have sports psychologists that travel with them to these events. So I kind of wanted to ask the both of you guys are there things that when you're competing at such a high level, you're dealing with injuries, trying to rank higher or lower and move around? Are there things that you guys do to kind of help with your mental well-being if you're feeling that strain of competing? I'll go to Polly first this time. We'll talk <laughs> this way. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've had um, support, luckily British Athletics and being on funding, you do get access to sports psychologists, which have been really helpful. Um, and then, I mean, I'm not ashamed. I've had issues with kind of anxiety and panic attacks. Libby will attest because I, in my first games in Rio, um, I, I think it was before my first event, but I had a real kind of panic attack anxiety before the next day. Um, and luckily there are people around, but I think it's something everyone goes through, especially in high pressure situations, which athletes have. Um, and I think it's great, A, that athletes are speaking out and putting themselves first over sport because everyone loves sport, but nothing's more important than your own well-being. Um, and I think it's great, actually, because I think people look at athletes and can see them as superhumans. So I think showing that everyone deals with things and especially around the stigma around mental health. Um, I think it's great that people speak out, speaking out about it as well. Yeah, Livy, on your end too, are there are there things that you suggest other athletes that are kind of like I know Polly had mentioned there's you have you have support put right into your team and your training. So for other um, young people that kind of feel that mental strain of themselves, like wanting to compete at their best or wanting or feeling that stressors of being a young person competing at such high levels, are there things that you would say, oh try to, how can you kind of support yourself as well or asking for help from other individuals? Yeah, completely. Obviously for myself, I started at such a young age. I went to 2012 at 16 years of age and obviously feeling the pressure of getting the bronze medal at the relay team. It was just like, oh my God, like, whoo, you know? But obviously at the end of the day, people do forget that we are human beings and we do have, we are human. We're not just superheroes, you know? And people do need to remember that. And obviously, it's really important to have a good team around you. Speak to them. If you're feeling pressurised, down, speak to your psychologist. Like, I've got a really good psychologist I've been to for, like, the last, since I've joined athletics, really. And she just gets me. And she knows my whole journey. And she knows what I've been through, ups and downs and stuff. And, you know, speak out. Don't keep it in. Because I think if you keep it in, it just gets bottled up and you... You're screaming inside, but you're not screaming outside, you know? So um, I think it's definitely a big thing. And it's really good that athletes are speaking out about it because it's just showing more awareness, you know? And it, the public need to remember we are human. And I love that, like you said, speak, it, and it will, it'll interfere just in, even if it's outside of athletics, if you don't have that outlet of some capacity, some people assume, oh, well, if you're, if you're stressed or anxious, you're an athlete, that's a way of releasing stress. Yeah. But if you're stressed but about the, the work that you're doing, even doing it's not going to be a benefit. So knowing, even like Polly had mentioned as well, having fellow teammates, having that outlet of asking a coach or a teacher, whichever sort of lane of sport that you're doing or anything, you'll always say that even, even a coach and you're in a school environment would then be able to give you that guidance of they might be a nice outlet to speak to or they might be able to then kind of relay you to someone else that would be a good communicator 
for you. So that using the community around you, even if you're a solo athlete, is a, a benefit um, for anyone as well. So I love that you both kind of touched on that as, as well. It's really, it's really nice. So we're going to switch, before I switch gears out of our news segment, and we go into our intermission story time, which you guys all know that I love. Before we get to that, I just want to, as I always do, thank all of you guys for watching and listening to the Invisive chat sessions. Um, it's our main virtual program we provide. It's our entertainment value of educating, as we like to say. So I always remind you guys that we do all of our programming resources and campaigns that we provide for free every month throughout the year. Um, is through donors and fundraisers like yourselves who are listening or watching. So we always do pop that donate link on the bottom. You'll see it on the screen if you're watching. It's in our description in the bio as well if you're listening. Um, we always say even one dollar or two or three pounds makes a huge difference to us. So we're able to provide programming and resources for free for incredible young people throughout the year. So I thank you guys for that as well. And then now we're going to go into the best time of our Invisive Chat Sessions episodes. It's story time, guys. It's so that one time. So that one time. No, I am such a chatty person. So, so that one time is when I get to sit back, drink my coffee, and let my guests tell us a story. So I'm looking at the two of you guys and wondering, who should I ask first to tell me a story? Should I go three-time Paralympian or two-time Paralympian? Who wants to go first? I'm going to see if one of you guys will volunteer first. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to go to Polly because our Zoom went <laughs> right to Polly as she started giggling. So I'm going to go to Polly first and then we'll go to Libby. Okay. Um, I, I would say my story's funny, but I'm not even sure it's funny. I think you've just got to feel slightly sad for 16 year old Polly. Um, so this is, I obviously went to Rio age 16. Um, so it's pretty exciting. I got to miss a bit of school. Um, I was super excited and I was like a lot of people had obviously messaged me from school so I was like this is so exciting um anyway on my return I, we had a little party um like in my house um and a couple of my school friends came and one of them uh ran up to me and she was like Polly you won't guess what's happening and I was like what and she was like they're having a school party in your honor like in the theme of like Rio, like Rio Olympics and Paralympics. I was like, no way. But I was also slightly like, are you sure? And she's like, no, no, absolutely positive. Um, <laughs> skip like a couple of weeks. Um, and I never got an invite to this party. Um, it went ahead, um, but it turns out it's, they have these, like I went to a boarding school slash day school. So a boarding house, which I wasn't a part of, but every house hosts a party and this one was themed that. So obviously it turned out I wasn't like, it wasn't based on me because I wasn't even invited. Um, but the worst bit was my friend who told me about it had an invite and went, but she was like, I have nothing to wear Polly. Would it be all right to wear some of your kit? And I was like, sure. Um, so she borrowed my kit to the event. Um, and later posted pictures on social media and lots of people thought she was me. So there are a lot of comments like, congrats on Rio, like you're such an inspiration. Um, so yeah, so I think it, the moral of the story is like, no matter what you do, like I think school, especially whatever your secondary school, high school will always ground you. Um, <laughs> so I wasn't, not only was the party definitely not about me, it just happened to be an Olympics party, but um, my friend took, any credit I might have got for it so <laughs> yeah <laughs> does your, I have to give a small shout out to your friend does your friend do any sports that she could throw some lingo out there and be like oh yeah when I did this jump like that it would have worked if she thought so I mean she did cross country running um I'm not sure she's ever done long jump or okay. but but like I should be fine <laughs> Um, and she fit the kit. She fit the kit perfectly. She wore my crop top. She looked amazing. Um. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. It's too good. Oh man. 
Libby, now I'm now I'm curious what direction you're gonna take your story in. Libby's like, well, mine's a very motivational story about this. Um, <laughs> Libby, it's your time to get the mic. <laughs> um, basically, my I don't know if this is like anything to do with relevant, but I'm just, it just comes to my mind about being back at school. Um, obviously, I went to 2012, and you know, missed a lot of school as Polly said herself. I was like, this is winning, this is great, we're in school, like, woo. Um, and then obviously, I, the 300 people from my school came to watch me for the relay, in the 4 by 100 relay. And obviously, I was thinking, I'm 16 years old. I've got several, we've got a several palsy team, and everybody mine can't get the better man. How the hell are we going to get the better man? And I was thinking, I'm the first leg runner. I've got my school sitting right where I'm hand, like right there and then they're, like, they're all like over the stadium but I was thinking this is so nerve-wracking they've all come up to see me they traveled up from like Hampshire to you know London to watch me but luckily we got a bronze medal but it was just amazing like them being there like my whole year group being there it was just so special and you know really exciting oh that is so exciting I can't so you were you were the first runner of the four yeah, it was so nerve-wracking. I was thinking, I'm 16 years old. These girls are really experienced. They all know each other. And I'm like, we only had two relay sessions, two relay training sessions. And I'm thinking, this is the most nerve-wracking thing ever. Oh, my God. But yeah, I got it over. I, oh, it over God. I, give, I give you mad props. Anytime I watch the relays and they have the baton, I'm like, me with nerve damage, I can lose the feeling in my hand. I'm like, that would just be... I would yeah. still probably be gripping it. They would be dragging me a few yards with them because I'd be like, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> also, when I'm, when I'm nervous, like, my hands get really sweaty. And I was trying to like, wipe my hands on my top to make sure they weren't sweaty. <laughs> oh my God. I would, but that, hey, you performed at an elite level and that whole, your all your classmates were like, damn, she's so much more talented yeah. than us now. Look at this. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, so funny. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking of my lack of athleticism at this point going, yeah, that wouldn't happen for me. Um, oh my <laughs> God. Um, well, me laughing to myself is actually a good transition for us to go into our second half of the show because our next segment is called Empower with Laughter. Empower with Laughter. Empower with Laughter is our segment because a big thing through Invisive is empowering teens and young adults to thrive in their life and especially with any health struggles or disability they may have. And getting to talk with these two, we're going to actually emphasize sort of this whole segment talking about the power of sport because I know the two of you have kind of mentioned it sort of in the beginning half of the show that you both got into athletics and especially in the track and field side of things from a very young age and it was really important in shaping your work that you do now in track and field but also just sort of shaping your confidence as a young person so I'm gonna go to Polly first what was what's sort of the most empowering thing about having sports in your life as a young person I think a big thing and I think a thing which is so important in the current climate is you have to trust and you learn to have a lot of faith and respect for your body because it's performing um quite a few obviously you have to trust it and it's especially obviously when you're doing something like long jump or 100 like you've really really got to trust it and you've got to make sure you nourish it um etc I think especially when you're I found and I think most teenagers especially in the current climate and with social media and about constantly but um body image issues and issues with how your body changes especially when you're obviously a teenager and you know your body's changing quite a lot and it can be quite a weird period of time I think having sport as release and something which um you really have to have your body and your body has to be fit and well and you also very thankful for it being fit and well because when you get injured it's really upsetting um I think that gives a new perspective to your body that I think perhaps otherwise I might not have had um, and I also knew that if I didn't fuel it properly or um, like, and you know, things like that, you, you weren't necessarily going to be able to compete or you weren't necessarily going to train as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's about, it was really important for me and empowering for me to have a new respect for my body um, through sport. Yeah, no, I love that. Cause it kind of, it kind of goes into what I was going to ask Libby as well. Cause I know 
Libby, talk, you talk quite a bit about how you got into sports at a young age, and it really was this level of building your confidence as a young person, because um, I know where Polly's more on the disability side, you're more on the chronic illness disability side um, mm -hmm. of things as well. So for, for other young people that might feel a bit nervous trying to get into sports, either if they've never gotten into sports and they're still dealing with their chronic illness or disability, or they're similar to myself where I was an athlete and I got injured, which then developed my chronic illnesses. So if I tried to get back into sports, what would be things from your experiences that you would sort of pass on as tips or advice to people that are a bit nervous to try sports out for themselves if they're dealing with chronic illness or disability? I think um, personally for myself and my personal experience, experience you just you don't know until you try. Um, mm. So if you find your if you go down to like a I don't know a club or anything really, you go down for the day or go down for an hour. Find your passion and see what you love and see what you love doing and enjoy and see where you can progress and just try. And if you don't know until you try. That's what I would say. Because personally, for me in athletics. I found out I was a fast when I was five years old. I won my sports day. And my parents were just like, oh my God, like this is amazing. Because obviously, like, they weren't sure where my life was going to go. Because obviously, I don't know, having cerebral palsy and some learning difficulties at school. Um, but yeah, sports been a massive thing for my life. A huge thing for my life. I never thought it would be my job. And I'm so grateful for that. But, you know, you just got to have the mental strength to have it as well and determination and never give up as well. Just, you don't know, in, yeah, and again, you don't know until you try. Yeah, I love that. It's like, um, it's like, sl like slowly leveling up for people. Like you were younger, you did like a, what would be you and all of your classmates. So it's yeah. like that slow, that slow kind of climb of try something in your house first if you're nervous of people and then maybe yeah. try to get friends involved, maybe try in school. It's that slow kind of leveling up. Um, and I think a big thing that you guys both really do show is even through injury or through competing, failing isn't actually failing. It's a, it's a benefit. I always learned from a lot of athletes, especially para athletes as well, is that not that you enjoy, not that you enjoy when you don't medal or succeed immensely, but that when you do something that's not to the best of your capability, it's such a learning move for you to then keep training differently. So you view what would be deemed like a fail, a fail or a trip up on something you guys use that as such a benefit for yourselves. And that's something that you really can I only kind of get from putting sport into your life, which I think is something very unique to how you guys both train and do your work in athletics as well. Yeah. And even kind of then going off of that, I wanted, Polly mentioned it before that you did sports at a young age, but you were, it, the idea of para-athletics wasn't really in your domain until it was I think how you mentioned it to me or you might have interviewed you said somebody noticed that your other sleeve wasn't like fully with another arm and found you running and was like oh damn she can be para-athlete <laughs> um and so on, on your end what are what would you say a big thing I always felt nervous about since I did athletics before my injury was how am I going to bring that up if I wanted try sports but the only avenue I can see around me is doing it in a school setting or in a club where I might be the only one with a chronic illness or disability that is a parent so what are your kind of tips for people that want to kind of bring that conversation up and try sports out I think the main one is you have every right to be there and to do sport just as much as anyone with a who's and fits into the able-bodied mold and it's taken me a long time um, I suppose to realize this and to truly kind of assess I suppose what I had a few kind of like ableist perceptions of sport myself that I've had to kind of deconstruct over the years um, I think I initially was very proud of the fact I could also do able-bodied sport and that because my disability is I've got one hand so I can do to a certain level I could compete to a certain level in able-bodied sport as well and I got a lot more legitimation for feeling that I was good at sport from that also it was a lot easier for me to obviously fit in and just about fit I suppose the ablest mold for sporting clubs um but it's over the last couple of years especially being at uni I've realized that that's that's not fair that everyone should have equal access to sports no matter if you can or cannot fit the ablest mold um it's not easy and a lot of times it's taken a lot of even for me like a lot of questioning 
Um, they were supposed to be um, at most unis and especially at Oxford, there is a really big thing to have an Oxford blue, which is like the highest sporting achievement. Um, and it's taken a lot of pushing from <laughs> different people um, to get Oxford uni to agree to have disability power standards for athletics. Um, and we're hopefully gonna try and make an inclusive varsity, but which is the Oxford Cambridge match, but that's still not a thing. Um, so I just suggest everyone, it's it's not nice and it, you shouldn't have to do it, but just remember that you're completely valid for wanting to be there and it's their issue if they can't accommodate you. It's not for you to try and accommodate them. Um, obviously great if you can find a local and I think it's really empowering to be around other disabled or chronically ill people if you can find a club which specifically for that but equally don't be afraid to go to your local club and say I want to participate um they won't always know the exact right way which is fine but and obviously encourage them but they should be able to and they should talk to you and about adapting it rather than yeah it shouldn't be your issue I mean Zed I think for years I've always concerned myself with making sure I can fit or reach whatever standards I need to be in to do able-bodied sport and that's not the way to look at it at all. Yeah, I love that. A big thing, like I always, I always will say, especially when you mentioned kind of trying that, discussing that with your current university as well to kind of show that equality in sport. Um, I always will tell everyone that if you sh if you walk in with your research and your homework done, it tends to help you out having having those statistics or research behind you always will make you feel more confident walking into a room asking for something that for someone who's non-disabled or not chronically ill, they, and from an athletic standpoint, they might not have that experience. So they, their, their negativity or their ignorance sometimes will hinder you. So I always will say, use that Google search bar and be like, insert the sport you want to try with, insert your illness or disability. And 95% of the time, somebody in some country has tried and gotten a news article on themselves joining a team or finding a para sport team. And you'll be able to kind of have that research. And like you said, Polly, kind of be able to go over to your school club or go to a teacher or coach and say, well, look, this has been done before. Can you try bringing me into it in practices or bringing me into a team setting? And so kind of that definitely has that backing between Polly's like, I'm dropping the interviews. <laughs> I'm set up. <laughs> when? <laughs> oh, Sorry about that. So much. We're good. We're good. We're good. It just went. It just pulled. Oh my god. Uh, it's just it's so me. Libby will attest, but like I'm always this person that something like this happens to. But yeah, okay, we're good. <laughs> Oh my god oh, it's like I love that this is because it's like you're the most elite of elite athletes meanwhile Polly's like yeah I'm just gonna my phone my computer will just like flip on its side yeah <laughs> I know As, I, I don't know how I've managed that I'm just gonna oh. check everything Oh my God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw, before I get to our final question for this segment, I wanted to throw one to Livy as well, because I know um, a big thing that a lot of young people will say if they're chronically ill or disabled is, oh, if I'm going to try a sport, all I'm going to be told is I'm inspirational for just showing up and not my actual skill. So how do you, when you're around other people, whether that's online or in an area and you want to you're doing sport how do you kind of showcase that you're just as much of an athlete as any non-disabled or chronically ill person that you're the word throwing it that I'm inspirational just because I'm showing up how do you kind of counter that if internally for yourself as well as the athlete I think first of all like for me I don't see myself as like brave that like, inspirational I just see myself as Livy. <laughs> That's the best way of putting it. Because um, I hate being called brave. Like, oh, you're so brave. I'm, like, I'm not brave. Like, just because I'm disabled and deaf doesn't mean I'm brave. That's who I am. I'm human. And I think everyone should just get treated equally. Like, if you've got a disability, if you've got an illness or anything, you should be treated equally. And you have every right to be there, you know? And it annoys me when people don't get treated equally like the able-bodied athletes get treated different to power athletes and it's just wrong like we work as hard as them probably even harder because we have our disability to worry about and our struggles you know and that needs to change personally that's why yeah. 
No, yeah, definitely. It's that your your skill set is what is inspiring, not just your your presence in the actual sport. And it's yeah. really, it's the big thing is I'll always try to encourage people is it can be super it can be super frustrating to have to be the the educator in the room always like trying to fight the the commentary but you have to always remember that if you tr- if you use your agitation on somebody who's being a bit ignorant or not understanding you're just going to make them feel a bit stupid and then they won't yeah. want to ask another para athlete or watch anything because they'll feel like they're stupid because they didn't ask they upset somebody else by asking a question or by just saying oh my god it's like you said you're just so brave for doing for showing up in the track no I think the two of you are both brave for hurtling your bodies into the air feet first into a sand pit because not doing that or just do like a little gallop into it not like as we as we see as we joke Polly's Polly's freeze frame photos as she jumps in the air also she has the most badass prosthetic arm as well so the whole (laughs) Polly is just great as well but watching the two of you train I know Libby puts up a lot of you doing your training and running or weightlifting like that's motivating as a whole just watching you do it it's not oh well I know Libby has CP so it's it's inspiring (laughs) damn look at her deathlift like that's great so like you said it's just constantly being okay having to answer the quote-unquote ignorant or stupid question or comment is you'll make that person feel more confident than saying it to someone else when they might see a para-athlete in a commercial you're like oh I remember when I watched Livy or I spoke to Polly and that kind of then sticks with them a bit moving forward which is great So my final question in this segment is I wanted to ask since the both of you will be obviously Tokyo got got delayed for a year and you're finally both going and all of that as well so what's I'll go to Polly first and then Livy so what's some one thing that you feel you're empowered and excited about looking forward to going to the Tokyo Paralympics? I'm so excited to go um anyway um as you followed my journey but um I got injured last year in March um and basically wrote off my season so had Tokyo been last year I wouldn't have been going so I kind of feel like I don't know I've I don't feel like I should be there like I'm just so excited for the fact that I've actually been able to go um yeah and I you know what I've always found the most empowering and I think the most fulfilling is meeting other people obviously like I'm so excited to spend lots of time with Livy and the rest of the British team um but it's also just so exciting meet I mean obviously it'll be different this year with COVID and social distancing but meeting my you know especially my international competitors and um yeah the generally the Paralympics community at large I always find yeah the most fulfilling the most empowering part of going away on any team what about you, Libby? Because this is your third Games. You've now been in three, con- <laughs> three different continents now. Going to the- so what makes you excited going for this one for Tokyo? Obviously, with COVID and stuff, like, it just makes it so appreciative that it's actually going ahead. Um, and I think having an extra year of training has helped me personally. And obviously for Polly, with her being injured, I'm just so grateful that she can be there. And it's just going to be so lovely to have her competing there. And she's a really good teammate. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to get there and just want to get on the plane now and just be like, okay, this is where we're going, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll be really excited to see everyone again, like the, all the other countries, like I love making friends with other countries, getting to know about their, their disabilities and like their training. It's just great to know and get to, I don't know, get another outcome in another country where their federation works and stuff. So yeah, I'm really excited to get there. I love that. And that's a good, that's a good, I'll make a nice transition from this segment to our final one, because the two of you are excited getting to meet international athletes. Our next segment gets to talk about that, I, that ideal world of getting to kind of connect with one another. So we are do our final segment called In an Ideal World. <laughs> In an ideal world, obviously, at Invisi Youth, a big thing for us is improving society and expanding awareness and inclusivity for the young adult chronic illness and disability community. But those can be massive builders to lift up the mountain by yourself. 
So we talk about what would be sort of the ideal ways and advice that Libby and Polly will be giving um, for young people, especially in sports, um, to be able to make it a more inclusive, but also a more diverse representation um, for it. So I know a big thing is that you guys have talked about a few times now is having that equal representation in media for para-athletics and also knowing that your training, your skill level is as equal to any other athlete coming in. So um, for Libby, was there a moment when you were at London or Rio that kind of reminded, reminded you of that sort of that value that para-athletics has that seeing those large crowds at, at both of those events that you were like, while so many people are coming to watch us compete and this is going to make a big uh, impact on them. Yeah, especially in 2012, we had like 8,000 people. Like, it was just, I never forget when I stood out in the 100 meter final for, um, and it was just like, I put my hands out, I'm just like, woo! It was just amazing. The best moment I've probably ever experienced. And I think since then, like Paralympic sport has, was really noticeable and people wanted to get involved and it was just really nice to see but since after Rio I didn't think there was as much people as much as many people joining power power sport up you know compared to 2012 obviously that was the home games and it was London but obviously Rio is in South America so there's quite a bit different and obviously it wasn't as much crowd and I just hope for this year for 20 for 2020 Tokyo happening, I just hope that people are really good to watch it on TV. Like I love watching the Olympics being being on. I just got so excited every morning. I've watched the athletics, or you know, come home from training, put the gymnastics on, or trampoline. You know, I just loved it, and I just hope people get as much excitement as that from the Paralympics now coming up in two weeks' time. So fingers crossed, it will. You know, we'll get sport out there more. We'll get this message out there, and it can change your life, and it can help with disability so much. Yeah, absolutely. And even Polly on your end, for someone that is kind of want, is introducing themselves to para-athletics or having the Paralympics for the first time and they're, they're on the TV and they're scrolling and they see it, what are ways that you feel like they, that sort of the general population can be supportive of the para-athletic community and athletes like yourself? I mean, there are so many ways. I mean, obviously for us, I mean, if you are a para, if you have a chronic illness or a disability and want to get involved, that's obviously fantastic. Equally, if you have some kind of expertise on the sport in terms of coaching or officiating, if you can, I suppose, be more open or adaptable and think about ways that you can encourage and include those with different the disabilities. Um, and then as Livy said, it's like for the para movement as a whole it's obviously really important that people actually get behind it and watch it and I think it's one of the most powerful ways to challenge perceptions on disability stereotypes is by actually watching it so yeah I think if you can follow like you know some of your fave dis like Paralympic Paralympians or watching it or sharing it online like that all appreciated as well <laughs> No, absolutely. Like you said, a big a big thing is that media attention because media gives more people visibility to all of your athleticism and capability, but also just from a funding standpoint, it brings that equal pay that as you being both female athletes as well that you guys don't see as often with male counterparts, but then also with non-disabled and healthy in quotes athletes that you guys are also getting sort of that proper equality of representation and, and pay as well is important and a social media following really does impact you guys as athletes as well that when people say oh I want fitness inspiration I'll always say find para athletes to follow from your country or that are doing what you guys enjoy in terms of fitness because like I mentioned the two of you show you guys training and those those are videos you guys post on your instagram stories or on your feed those are things that are important for you guys to share as you're training as well as the big meets and medals and all of that and that really is a level of diversifying what would be just sort of your fitness inspo follows on instagram in a way is 
is a benefit. Like I mentioned, Livy doing her dead weight lifting and Polly just throwing her body in the air. I'm always like, yep, follow. What? That's my <laughs> that's my fitness inspiration for the moment because I'm not putting those weights on my back. Um, so <laughs> is that is that is a really like you said, it's super important. And I think another question I wanted to ask um, on Livy's end as well is a big thing people will always hear young people say they worry about is, oh, if I try to do sports, I'm worried people will say I'm not, I'm, I'm not disabled enough or, oh, well, you're, or you're not chronically ill enough because if you're able to do these sports, how bad, in air quotes, is your illness or disability? So if you're kind of feeling that nervousness of doing it in a club setting or posting about you doing fitness or sport, what would you say to those young people that, feel that nervousness that they'll be challenged by other people saying it I think you know just embrace who you are and don't be afraid of what people think of you you know me learning growing up with a disability like I just learned to not think not care what people think of me because I am who I am and you know everyone's different we're all human and just be proud of who you are and what you've achieved and embrace your feelings as well so go ahead and post <laughs> so I love that even on Polly on your end too because I know you your injury from last year as well you didn't what I always loved about you on your end Polly is you had your injury you mentioned it but you didn't like disappear from Instagram for your like 10 weeks of rehabbing and then pop up and be like look at me crushing my physiotherapy goals you like showed your your process that this was a, a recovery process for you and a kind of slow moving train and kind of showing that pulling the curtain back that you're not in, in quotes, like the superhuman athlete coming in and bouncing back right away from an injury. You are, de you are dealing with what the other side of that is like, especially being an athlete with a disability too. Um, so how did you, how did, if you got different reactions, pros and cons, how did you kind of handle that reaction of you going through training and then going back into competing? Yeah. I mean, I think, it was, it's always important to try and show the downsides to sports. I think most people will say there are more, often more downsides to upsides. The upsides definitely make up for it, but there's a lot of times where you have injuries or like you're not competing so well. And I think it's important to show that because again, I think coming back to the whole stigma around athletes maybe and trying to kind of show that we're not necessarily superhuman is that, yeah, we, you know, a lot of the time we're not, things are going wrong and, you know things aren't easy and I think that's the other thing I think generally people think that athletes things come easily to them or that training is easy and that's why they're good most of the times it's because we're the ones that have stuck around the longest when it's things have been a bit rubbish um so yeah I think and in terms of neg I generally didn't get too many negative comments I mean there's not really I don't know I don't think there's anything mean you can really say at that stage because I was at such a low point you probably like couldn't have hit me any further like I'm not sure there's much you could have said I don't know your moon boot looks bad or something but I don't care um <laughs> but I think it's it was difficult because you obviously get a lot of positive well encouraging comments being like um you know like you'll get stronger from this like this injury will make you stronger and like I look back now like definitely mentally it has but like you don't really that like, is kind of stuff you don't really want to hear at the time you're like oh okay fine um so I think it's about focusing on you and trying to I suppose push through whatever barriers you have and be open about them um but as Livy says don't let other people affect you too much be positive in what you want your, what you're doing yeah I love that that's really good it's it's sort of not if you get sort of negative comments or that ignorant comment at any point it's it's knowing your own worth and 90 percent of the time it's because they don't understand that you are training multiple days of a week I mean this for both of you guys this is a career it's not just a hobby as well this is a bit this is a majority of your life is is training and knowing like you said that it's not always perfection. You are kind of the ones that stick around is like my favorite thing. Because as a, someone with chronic illness or disability, you are the ones that 80% of a physiotherapy or having a flare up, you're the one that has to stick around because it is your body. So you have to just kind of bear with it and kind of soldier on through any flare ups or issues. So like you said, it is, it shows that that mental determination is what should be Kind of your focus and I know I was going to ask um, the both of you guys this question because um, about like you said the two of you met through sports and that's how developed that teammate that friendship as well 
Um, so for young people that are wanting to try and do sports with their friends, what would be, I'll ask Livy first, what are ways that if your friends don't know a lot about trying to include you in like them doing sport games with their friends or like rec weekends and doing things and they're nervous about you being their friend that they might know has a chronic illness or disability. Um, and they're nervous, as I always say, my friends would say, I don't want to injure you. So like, just watch me, like, don't play with us because we're so scared to hurt you. Um, so what would be your kind of advice for the friends of people who have a chronic illness or disability to like, let them feel like they're learning more or being su a supportive support network for people? I mean, if you're nervous, then, you know, just be, be do it with people you're really comfortable with and you're really open with and start off there. And then the more comfortable you get, the better you are, at whatever you do, move it to another level you know but for me I'm a person that loves to get involved I love team I love doing team sport I love playing games I'm very competitive but I love doing it it's just so fun you know <laughs> but um if you're all nervous just do it with a small group of people who really who you really trust and who really know you build it from there and then build it up to another level I like that yeah and Polly on your end too what would be advice that you would give to your friends that might be healthy and non-disabled if they're wanting to kind of be that supportive, that cheerleader friend of yours as you're training or wanting to involve you more in sort of their fun sports that they do together, what would be your advice to those that support network, those friends? Yeah, I think the main thing is to encourage people not to second guess what they think you can and can't do. Um, I've found that most people underestimate what they think my capabilities are and obviously there are some stuff I have to do differently but also I've like I've lived with it for 21 years so most of the times I can find adaptions or way to do things so yeah I think it's just encouraging people not to make assumptions and obviously um allowing you to pull, pull out or decide not to do something if you decide that you're not capable of it but most of the time I think you know keeping open telling you what they're actually doing detailing out and then I think most of the times there is a way around things it's just not necessarily conventional no, I love that. And I think a big thing I'll always say is a lot of for young people that are friends, they don't want to ask the, the dumb question of their friend being like, I don't, I'm like nervous to do something with you, or I don't want to, I don't know how to handle if X, Y, or Z happens. Cause like, I'm not a medical professional is what my friends would say. You go down. I can't help you. It was always their <laughs> reaction to me. Um, but if you, I think a big thing is kind of send those links to your friends of watching them do someone else doing a para athletic and or incorporating someone else into sports, kind of send them those video links of showing that integration. Cause then they kind of get that visual. Um, is really important and I always say let them let them try out your adaptive sporting way so watching someone kind of come into your turf and doing it is also I think a fun way of you guys being in control of the situation it's in your domain where you know how to do things and bring your friends in and say well have, how about you guys come to when I do a training or when my team is playing and doing a para-athletic event and I think that kind of really opens up their eyes to getting to do it. And also then have a bit of, have a bit of fun when you know that you can kind of slightly hustle your friends. You're like, oh yeah, I just, I just run a little bit. Like it's fine. And then just like beeline right by them. Um, Livia would wait on the other end and be like, I'll wait until you get here. Like, <laughs> but I, like you said, I think that's great is knowing your, what, how your strength and your capability is really a, a benefit for yourself, um, feeling confident in uncomfortable situations. And then to end our show, I always ask our two guests to give us a piece of advice. So I wanted each of our guests to be able to give us a piece of advice that they might have been given during their years of somebody that wants to kind of get fueled up into sports or feel more confident in sports so I'm gonna go three-time Paralympian to two-time this time around so we'll go to Livy first um, <laughs> so what's a piece of advice that um, you've been given by a coach or a friend or someone that really has stuck with you on those on those challenging days or days you need to like feel revved up for me um being told that I can't do it and then I'm like I can prove them wrong then and also never give up those are my two things. 
never get someone should never say to you you can't do it because you can I love you that until you try. <laughs> I love that and then Polly on your end what's a piece of advice you'd give it's actually a quote and it's one that my dad's told me many times and I'm not going to read it out because it's actually pretty long um, but it's by Theodore Roosevelt and it's called The Man in the Arena but I love it and it's the like sentiment of it is like ha like there is no shame in trying and failing um, and you know don't let the critics who sit at the sidelines and don't try um, ever get to you or judge you because you're the person who's in the arena with I think it's like blood sweat on your face but you're the person who's trying um, and you might not you might know a lot of defeat but you also probably know success as well and I think it's called like the timid souls who sit at the sidelines won't know like victory or defeat um, and I always think it's a really powerful one about pushing like pushing yourself and pushing through your own personal boundaries and challenging yourself and not letting other people other people's judgments or perceptions of you ever get in the way I love that that now the two of you are going to be in Tokyo thinking about Ted and Theodore Roosevelt and which, um, the American in me is just like that's just hysterical that Polly's going to be thinking about a former American president while she's in Tokyo competing be like Ooh, I need that motivation at the moment I love that. Thank you guys so much for being on this episode. I appreciate it so much um, as well. And I know when we're recording this, we're like basically 48 hours from when Libby will be flying out to Tokyo when this comes out. Um, we'll basically be right when their track and field for Paralympics starts as well. So that'll be exciting pretty much right when this comes out. Livy starts first in her events, Polly then follows in her events after. So it'll be exciting when this comes out and you guys are listening or watching. They're actually in Tokyo then um, and competing. So I'm going to let them share their handles and then remind you guys as well where you guys can watch. Um, if you guys know where people would be able to follow Team GB for the Paralympics as well. Um, so people can definitely follow you both on your journeys, but then support the Paralympics and the team that you're on. So I'll go Polly first and she's on my screen. Polly, take your handles away. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to go for the general ones first. So from like British, there's Paralympics GB um, for Twitter and Instagram and, um, and then Channel 4 Paralympics, which kind of is the main British broadcaster of coverage. Um, and then classic Paralympics, which have in all kind of like social media platforms. And then for me, it's Polly Mayton, like all lowercase P-O-L-L-Y-M-A-T-O-N. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And Livy, where can we, and you recently became Blue Tick Verified too, Livy. So I'm just going to give you a little shout out on that one. <laughs> um, so where can people find you on social media? So on my Twitter, it's Livy Green, so L-I-V-V-Y. Underscore Breen, so B R W E N, and then on Twitter it's Breen Olivia, so Breen oh. and then Olivia. Yeah, love that. Going going for the traditional name on that one for Twitter. I like that. <laughs> uh, that's great. And yeah, especially in the states, NBC is where you guys can find all the Olympic Channel that we have as well, and you guys will be able to follow the Paralympics through that and on Instagram. Um, as well. You'll definitely see us posting about it throughout the weeks of the Paralympic Games at the end of the month and into the beginning of September. So you guys will be able to see Livy and Polly. You know that we'll be shamelessly sharing anything that the two of them are in in the media onto our Instagram story when they're competing. So you guys can watch them as well. And if you want to follow InvisiYouth on social media and learn more about us, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at InvisiYouth. You can go to our YouTube channel at Invisive Charity to subscribe there and watch all of our great um, episodes and our YouTube shorts that we now put out. I might be dancing in one of them a little bit um, horribly, and so that's a spoiler. And um, then you can follow and subscribe to our audio podcast on any audio podcast platform you can find from Apple Podcasts to Google and Spotify um, and give us a subscribe and a little rating and review as well it definitely helps us out so much so ladies i'm gonna wish you guys the best of luck in tokyo absolutely crush it jump as far as you can and do your absolute best i'm absolutely looking forward to it 
And thank you both for being on the show. And everybody, I will speak to you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>